I'm Pastor Paul Miller, and I want to welcome you to a six-week study entitled Christianity Explained. And um, if you were uh, actually sitting right across the table from me, then uh, I would have probably already invited you to make a commitment to do a six-week study to just answer a question. What does it mean to be a Christian? And I want to, to share with you that uh, this is going to be a very low-pressure type thing on your part. And, uh, and here's what I mean by that. Again, if we were sitting across the table from one another, I would have made you these commitments. I would have said, number one, I promise you, I'm not going to be asking you Bible questions. Uh, this is not a time for me to see what you know about the Bible. Uh, I would have promised you that I'm not going to be asking you to do the reading, at least publicly or out loud, and I would have also committed to you that I'm not going to be asking you, calling on you to volunteer to pray out loud. And so again, uh, you know, we're wa you're watching this by video, and so certainly uh, those commitments aren't as relevant, but I wanted you to know that typically if you and I were doing this study together, I would have made you those three commitments, and I would have asked you, and I'm asking you now, to make a, a commitment to at least do all six of these sessions. We'll do one session per week. That's a great way to do it. And so, here we go. Let's, let's talk about what does it mean to be a Christian, and let me give you um, just some understanding of why I've decided to be a Christian, and what does that even mean? In a, in a biblical sense of the word. Now, uh, Christianity explained, as, as we think about the word Christianity, you know, the first thing we realize is the first six letters of the word Christianity spells Christ. And, and so as the name Christianity implies, Christianity is all about the person of Jesus Christ. Who is he? You know, we've got a question today that I kind of want to answer. What makes Jesus any different from any other religious leader? I mean, let's face it. There are many religious leaders who have lived and taught and even died through the centuries. For example, what makes Jesus any different than Muhammad? Uh, what makes Jesus any different from Confucius or Abraham or Buddha or Joseph Smith, and of course, the list could go on and on and on. Well, let me call your attention to the fact that in the Bible, we do have uh, four biographies of Jesus' life. Now, let me back up. Many of you know this, but I want to tell you that the Bible is divided into sort of two halves. The first half is what we call the Old Testament. And the Old Testament kind of tells the story of creation and tells the story of God's people looking forward to and hearing about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus, the Son of God. And then the second half of the Bible is what we call the New Testament. And the New Testament actually records the coming of Jesus to the earth and uh, in his life and ministry here, and then uh, his uh, leaving his ministry to the disciples, and it records the birth of the church. And so, within the New Testament, the first four books of the New Testament are what we call the Gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And and in the Gospels, we find that these are records; these are historical documents, ancient manuscripts that give us biographies of, of Jesus' life. Now, over our time together, we're going to mainly study one of those biographies, the book of Mark. Mark is the shortest and maybe the oldest of the four Gospels. It was written by John Mark. He was not a disciple of Jesus, but he did get his information uh, from one of Jesus' disciples, from Peter. And, uh, and so, the other thing I want to tell you before we get too far is this. You know, guys, I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And uh, you're going to see that as we go through this study of Christianity, I'm going to refer to the Bible for truth. 
I'm going to look to the Bible for answers. Uh, and so you need to know that part of being a Christian is being a man or a woman of faith. And really, that's who I am. I'm a man of faith, and I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It's the absolute truth that I can take it at God's Word. And so uh, that'll be important to our study. Now, let's do this. Let's picture Christianity as though it were the seat on a three-legged stool. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a mechanical engineer to know that a two-legged stool is not going to stand. you got to have all three legs. You know, the same is true of Christianity. If you lose one of the legs, the Christianity is going to fall. You know, these three legs are three fundamental pillars of truth. These three legs on this stool represent three core doctrines of Christianity. And today, for our first lesson, let's just study doctrine number one. Again, who is Jesus? You know, the first leg of our three-legged stool says that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is the Son of God. As a matter of fact, let me show you uh, what it says here in the very first verse of Mark chapter 1. Would you turn there? Mark chapter 1 verse 1. And if by chance you are using one of our NIV paperback Bibles, you can turn to page 699 and your page numbers may, may be different. But Mark chapter number 1 and I just want to show you what the very first verse says. It says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now look at that. The word good news there, that's our word gospel. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus, the Messiah, and then it says, comma, the Son of God. And so the first thing I, I want you to see is that as we think about Christianity and as we think about this first leg on the three-legged stool, Jesus is the Son of God. Now, when we say that, immediately it brings up a question. What does that mean? For example, does that mean there was a time there was no Jesus because one day God had a son and then there was a Jesus? Actually, that's not what it means. You know, again, I'm going back to saying this. At the end of the day, I'm a man of faith. I believe the Bible. And the Bible presents our God, the one true God, as one God in three persons. This is known as the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the concept, the understanding that we have one God who manifests himself to us in three persons, he exists in three persons, it's all throughout the Bible from the beginning to the end. And so, again, can I fully explain to you mathematically, philosophically, how God can be one God in three persons? No, I can't. But I told you, at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a man of faith. At the end of the day, I believe the Word of God is God's Word. And even though I can't fully wrap my mind around how there can be one God in three persons, I believe it. So, for example, I could say to you, Jesus is not only the Son of God, but He's God the Son. Think about it like this. I have three boys. I could say this. If the Son of a human is a human, then the Son of God is God. Think about that. If the Son of a human is a human, then the Son of God is is God. And that's really what we mean when we say Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God the Son. Now you say, Pastor Paul, that's a, that's a pretty uh, incredible claim that Jesus is God. Uh, can you give me some kind of uh, uh, rationale, some kind of uh, evidence that you believe that? Well, absolutely. That's what this first lesson is all about. We're trying to understand what separates our religious leader, our, our faith leader from any other. What separates Jesus from Muhammad? Well, I submit to you, it is Jesus' authority. 
And so let's take a few minutes today and let's look at the Gospel of Mark, this biography, if you will, that's given to us by God through human authors um, and, and look at Jesus' authority. So would you be with me here in Mark chapter number 1? And I just want to show you some evidence of Jesus' authority that shows us He is God the Son. Let's just actually pick up in verse 21. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. It says, They went to Capernaum, which, by the way, is a city on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. You see, Jesus' earthly ministry spanned, his public ministry spanned about three years. And much of it was spent on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And this is one of those little towns. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, now the Sabbath is simply the day of rest for the Jews. It was the day that God rested after the six days of creation. And uh, so when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue. Now that's very simply the Jewish church building, if you will, and began to teach. Verse 22, the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. There's the word. That's the word we're looking at. Not as the teachers of the law. So the first thing I want you to see in our study of Jesus as the Son of God is that he had a very supernatural authority as a teacher. When they heard him teach, they said, wow, he teaches with authority not like the teachers of the law. You see, they're referring to the scribes and the Pharisees who would teach by making appeals to other more well-known teachers. For example, I do this when I preach. Sometimes I might say, hey, let me read you a quote from Billy Graham. Or maybe I might read a, a passage from a commentary by John Piper or John MacArthur or David Jeremiah. But Jesus never did this. When Jesus taught... He taught with an unparalleled, unprecedented authority. Jesus said things like this, You have heard it said, Do not commit adultery. But I say to you, if a man looks at a woman lustfully, he's already committed adultery in his heart. Wow. Jesus is taking the commands of the Old Testament and he's bringing them to the heart. He's bringing a fresh understanding of what they really mean and so he taught with authority let's let's look at the same page here verse 29 mark chapter 1 as soon as they left the synagogue they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew Simon and Andrew were brothers they were two of his Jesus's disciples by the way James and John were also brothers and they were two more of Jesus's disciples it says, verse 30, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. Simon, by the way, later Jesus will give him a new name. He'll name him Peter, and sometimes you'll see him referred to as Simon Peter. So his mother-in-law, his wife's mother, is in bed with a fever. And so they told Jesus about her. In verse 31, he went to her took her hand and helped her up. Look at this. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Now, let me remind you that this is not 21st century. We're reading about 1st century. There's no ibuprofen. There's no Tylenol. There's no aspirin. Now, we don't know exactly what Simon's mother-in-law had. Maybe it was the flu. Maybe it was strep throat. Uh, maybe it was pneumonia. But we know that she was sick, and she was so sick she had gone to bed. And we know in that day, and even today in third world countries, fever can be very dangerous. Fever can kill you. But Jesus goes in, and when he grabs her by the hand, the Bible says the fever left her. And I want to call your attention to the fact that not only did her fever break, and maybe you've had the flu, or maybe you've had a sickness, and you finally had your fever break, and you feel so drained and so washed out and your temperature drops and you have no energy. But what did she do? The Bible says 
immediately the fever left her and she began to wait on them. You know, in the language of the New Testament, what that means is this. She prepared and served them a meal. Again, first century. There are no microwaves. There's no refrigerator with a, you know, a, a ham ready to pop in the oven. No, that means she's got to gather the charcoal, gather the wood, build a fire. She may have to go and kill a chicken or a goat. This is a major deal. Here's my point. Jesus has authority over sickness. It's a supernatural authority over sickness. Let's keep reading. Look over at Mark chapter number 4. We're building a case to understand what makes Jesus different from any other religious leader. Mark chapter 4. I'm on page 702 in my NIV paperback. Um, Mark chapter 4 verse 35. The Bible says, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Now, let me tell you what that means. A lot of times, rather than walk all the way around the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, it was a lot quicker to just get in a boat and sail straight across the north shore there, the north end of the sea. And as we say sea, it's actually a, a lake. And so it says, um, verse 36, Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Verse 37 says, A furious squall or, or storm came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, verse 39, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Verse 40, he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified. And it says, They asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know, I uh, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia area, and we would go down to Daytona Beach in uh, in in the summertime. And I can remember looking out and on a windy day and seeing the waves white capping. As a matter of fact, we uh just north of where I live here in Iowa, we have a a one mile long bridge across Red Rock Lake, and it's always windy here in Iowa. And sometimes I go across that bridge and I look out across Lake Red Rock and and I see the waves are white capping out there on the lake. And you know the Sea of Galilee is about 690 feet below sea level and yet um, around uh, the the shore would, would be the Golan Heights and there's these these almost like mountains and, and the cool air would come off the Golan Heights and they would hit the warm air right there on the Sea of Galilee and even though it's not a very large lake, it would cause these violent storms to, to be produced. And uh, Jesus' disciples, you know, they were fishermen, and so this must have been some storm because Jesus is down in the stern in the back of the boat. He's asleep, and the disciples are so upset. They're like, teacher, don't you care if we drown, right? And Jesus comes up out of the stern of the boat, and he speaks to the wind and to the waves and says, quiet be still. You know, I I think about my years growing up in Georgia and how I enjoyed going to the lake and water skiing. And I can remember it, the lake would be so choppy by the end of the day. And it would take all night for the waves to finally settle down. And you know, when Jesus spoke, the Bible says it was completely calm. What was he talk what is the Bible talking about? It was completely calm. That's not only the wind, but the waves. Again, sometimes in Iowa, right at sundown, the wind will kind of all of a sudden calm down. But the waves, they don't calm down. It takes all night 
for the waves to calm down. But at Jesus' command, the Bible says, even the waves obey him. You know, there's an interesting verse back in uh, Psalms. Psalm 89, uh, verse number 9. Let me read this to you. This is the psalmist talking about God. He says, You rule over the surging seas. When its waves mount up, you still them. Don't you know these Jewish men were amazed when Jesus did what the psalmist said God would do. He stilled the waves. Here's my point. Jesus has authority over nature. Jesus has authority over nature. And so we're building a case here to show that Jesus is unlike any other religious leader. Authority as a teacher. Authority over sickness. Authority over nature. Let's read on. Mark chapter number 5. Would you turn there to Mark chapter number 5? And let me pick up reading in verse number 21. I'm on page 702. It says this, Mark 5, 21, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Let me pause and just help you understand. By this point, Jesus has been doing a number of miracles, and he's beginning to get quite a reputation as a, as a healer. And there's a man named Jairus, and he's a synagogue leader. And uh, what, what that means is not only is he a respected religious teacher or religious man, but uh, the synagogue was also a political type place. It would almost be like the church building and city hall all in the same place. And so here's a very prominent man in the city. He's a well-to-do man, but he is desperate. And I would be too if my little daughter was dying. And so he goes and he falls at Jesus' feet and he's pleading earnestly, please come and help us. My daughter is dying. So Jesus went with him. Now, uh, another miracle is going to take place right here, and we're going to come back to it in another session. But I want us to skip to verse 35 and pick back up with Jairus' story. It says, While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion. People were crying and wailing loudly. Verse 39, He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her uh, by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kaum, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Verse 42 says, Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. Wow. Why were they completely astonished? I'll tell you why. It's because Jesus just showed us he has authority over death. He has authority over death. You know, it's very interesting. Jesus um, gets the word that, you know, the girl has died. Uh, somebody comes running up to Jairus and says, let him go. Don't bother the teacher. Your, your daughter is dead. You know, I certainly would not come and tell anybody that their child had died unless I had my facts straight. You know, we know that this little girl had actually died because 
they had their facts before they came. And they told Jairus, your daughter is dead. As a matter of fact, it took them so long to get back to Jairus' house that they already had the professional mourners in place. You say, what are you talking about? I simply mean this. The way you would honor the family who lost a loved one in this culture, first century, is you would actually gather people and have them weep and wail outside the home. And you would even, if it's a well-to-do family like Jairus, you would even hire people. You would even bring in people who would weep and wail and mourn outside the home. Wow, we, it's, it's different in our culture. We buy flowers. They would probably think that's crazy and different like we think their culture is different. My point is this. This little girl had died. And the evidence is here that when Jesus said, no, she's just asleep, they laughed at him. Now, sometimes the, the word sleep does mean death, but what's Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, no, I'm going to bring her back from death. I'm going to bring her back from this sleep. Jesus has authority over death. Now, these four ways we've seen Jesus' authority would be in the natural world. But I want to show you three more ways we see Jesus' authority in the supernatural world. Go back to chapter 1, if you will. Mark chapter number 1, page 699. And look with me at verse number 23. Verse 23 says, Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. There's our word again. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. Now, of course, our point here is that Jesus has authority over evil spirits. You may know this already, but Evil spirits are also called demons. They are fallen angels and they are real. You know, when uh, God created the angels, he created this one angel named Lucifer. His name means light bearer. And you can read about Lucifer's tragic story in uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. But Lucifer had a very privileged position in heaven. His job was a priestly Function. He was in charge of guarding the worship of God. But you know, Lucifer decided rather than guarding God's worship, he would rather have God's worship. And he got proud and, 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 and began to lift himself up as the one who was worthy of worship. But only God is worthy of our worship. And so God kicked him out of heaven. And the Bible seems to indicate in Revelation that a third of the angels fell with him. And they're real, but they're fallen. And they're evil spirits. But here's the good news. Jesus has authority over demons. He has authority over evil spirits. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is the agent of creation. That all things were created by him and for him. And that means that Jesus created the angels. No wonder they knew his name. No wonder they were cowering in fear over Jesus' authority. He created them. Let's look at Mark chapter number 2. Mark chapter number 2. And I'll show you another way we see his authority. It says a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat 
the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now before we read on, let's just try to get this picture in our mind. These four guys have a friend who's paralyzed. And they have heard about Jesus' miracles. Maybe they've seen, they've witnessed some of Jesus' miracles. And they know, man, if we could just get our buddy to Jesus, Jesus could heal him. So they go and they put their friend on a stretcher, on a mat. And these four guys get on each corner and they haul him up the road to the place where Jesus is teaching in this house. The problem is, it's so crowded that they can't even get inside the house. And so being, uh, you know, determined to help their friend, they go up on the roof of the house, which in those days would have been made of mud and, and straw. And, and so they, they dig a hole in the roof. Can you imagine that scene? The dirt's falling and everybody's looking up and here they lower this man down on his mat in front of Jesus. And in that moment, Jesus says something unbelievable. He looks at this man lying on this mat and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Wow, look what happens next. Now, some of the teachers of the law in verse 6 were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, Get up, take your mat, and go home. Verse 12, he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Why are they so upset? Well, these teachers of the law accuse Jesus of, of blasphemy because they know, according to the Old Testament, only God can forgive a man of his sin. And Jesus looks at this man and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus, here's more evidence that he has the authority of God. He reads their minds. He knows what they're thinking in their hearts, and he calls them out on it. And he says, Look, what would be easier, to say to this man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say to a paralyzed man, Arise and walk? Well, let's think about this. On one hand, the hardest thing to do would be to forgive him of his sins, but it would be really easy to say, your sins are forgiven. How can I prove that? On the other hand, if I said to a paralyzed man, I have the authority to heal you and you don't get up and walk, I'm a fraud. I'm a fake. And so Jesus' point is this. I'm going to prove to you I have the authority to forgive sin. I'm going to do the hard thing. I'm going to heal this man of his paralysis and I'm going to prove to you that I have this authority and sure enough the man picks up his mat and he walks out in front of them all when Jesus refers to himself as the son of man that is a, a title for the Messiah the one who would come to rescue his people from way back in the book of Daniel it was actually one of Jesus favorite ways of referring to himself here's the point Jesus, God the Son, the Son of Man, the Son of God, He has the authority to forgive us of our sin. Let me show you one more before we finish. Look back at chapter number 1, Mark chapter number 1, verse 16. It says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Verse 19. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat 
preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. You know, Jesus has authority over people. Jesus had authority to walk up to these two sets of brothers who were fishermen. This was their livelihood. This is what they did with their lives. This is all they knew. And said, guys, put down your nets. Come follow me. Jesus has authority over people. Jesus had authority to come to me in my life in 1982 and invite me to come and follow him. Jesus has authority to ask you to follow him. You know, as we close this very first lesson and we look at these, this list, we've got things in the natural world and things in the supernatural world. Jesus has authority. But you know, have you ever seen G, uh, uh, germs and viruses and sickness say no to Jesus? You never have and you never will. Have you ever seen the wind and the waves say no to Jesus? You never have, and you never will. Even death has no option to say no to Jesus. We look at the demons. They had no ability to say no to Jesus. But you and I know plenty of people, don't we, who say, you know what, Jesus? I do not respect your authority. I don't want you to have authority over my life. I want to do it my way. Miss Brandy and I have raised five kids, and if you've raised children, you remember those moments where your kids say, let me do it. I'll do it my way. You know what that is? That's our sin nature. That's the result of the fall of man. We don't have to teach our children to be rebellious. We don't have to teach our children how to be selfish, how to cheat, lie, or steal, do we? No, it comes natural. It's because we are bent away from God and we are bent away in our natural state from a desire to submit to Jesus' authority. And so our lesson today kind of ends with some tension because we see clearly from the book of Mark, from this biography of Jesus' life that is given, inspired of God, that Jesus has a very supernatural authority. Authority in the, in the natural realm and the supernatural realm. But we also are reminded here at the end that people are the ones who have the audacity to say, Jesus, I don't want your authority. Now let's just stop and let you take a week to kind of think through these things and think about who do you believe Jesus is. Is he the Son of God? Is he God the Son? And then begin to think about what will be your response to Jesus' authority. You know, some call Jesus the man that you can't ignore. You know, you can respond to Jesus in one of several ways. You could say, Jesus is just a liar. He claimed to be all these things, but he was just lying. You could say, Jesus was a lunatic. He was just crazy, and I don't know how he did what he did. Maybe he was a magician like David Copperfield, or you must say this, he's the Lord. He's the Son of God. He truly is God the Son. You know, I want to close with this idea. I want to share with you that he is the Son of God. And he wants to lay hold of your life. But do you know what, though? You can believe the things that I've shared with you today intellectually. You can say, yes, I believe that he's the Son of God. And still die and go to hell for eternity. You know, there's. you say, Pastor Paul, why would you say these things? Well, it's because Christianity is like the seat on a three-legged stool. And so far, all we've done is talk about one of those three legs. And so I want you to really think about these things and commit to all six of these lessons. And, uh, and then do this. In the coming days, would you read the first five chapters of the book of Mark in your own time? You can even listen through your phone, Bible Gateway, or one of the Bible apps. 
and, uh, and just jot down questions as you go through those first five chapters of the book of Mark. Read them slow, jot down questions, and then you feel free to contact me or maybe your local pastor or, or a Christian that you've been building a relationship with and try to work through some of those questions. I look forward to seeing you next week.